off by asking if there are any questions about the previous talk. But since I rushed at the end, and I did not cover everything I wanted to say, and also there were many relevant questions that I was asked by other people about the same material, I'll start my talk now by reviewing the end of last talk. And I'll add some more explanations and address questions that I was asked in private. And then we'll pause for a longer set of questions uh, before I move to the next topic. So we started with U1 level 2, which we wrote the Lagrangian is 2 over 4 pi. And since we're in Euclidean space, we put it pi, bdb. And we couple it to two, th two things. First of all, we added a background field. So recall that uppercase is a background field, and lowercase is a dynamical field. <coughs> and the question I, I was asked is the following. The U1 level 2 topological field theory does not have any global U1 symmetry. So how can we couple it to a background U1 field? In fact, this I was asked this question in several different contexts in the last uh, 48 hours. And I see some people in the audience nodding. So the statement is that the topological field theory does not have a U1 global symmetry. That's not a symmetry of the theory. The theory of the observables are lines, and that's it. So there are no local operators, and if there are no local operators, there cannot be a, a, an ordinary global symmetry. Yet we can couple it to a U1 background field in this fashion. So these two facts do not contradict each other. So that's the first thing. The second thing we did was that said that this, is, this theory is not a spin t QFT. We want to make it a spin theory. A spin theory means that it depends on the choice of spin structure. And a simple way to do that is to tensor a decoupled sector, this one comma psi theory, which we decided to describe by writing here minus i over 4 pi CDC. Let me make sure that I, so this is u1 level minus 1. Yeah, that's a notation from last time. So now, the theory depends on the choice of spin structure only because of this factor. From here, we have two lines. We can call them 1 and psi. And we can also describe this one as 1, and this one as e to the i c. This is the line operator. This theory, this sector, also has two lines, 1 and e to the i b. And since there are two lines here, two lines here, and it's a product, we can have them as four lines. We have altogether four lines. A comment about terminology, this line, or this one, is referred to as a transparent line. It's transparent because it has trivial braiding. It has trivial braiding with everything. But it's still a non-trivial operator in the theory. There was some confusion about that in earlier talks. So, this is a non-trivial line because it allows us to measure the spin structure. In that sense, it's non-trivial. It's transparent in the sense that it has trivial braiding. So the word transparent and what it's a, whether it's a line or not was used somewhat carelessly before. I think this terminology makes sense. This is also the original terminology in the original papers. And then I pointed out that surprisingly, this theory has a time reversal symmetry, and it can be seen classically. It can be seen classically by performing the following time reversal transformation, even with the background field. And at this point, I pause to say, what do we mean by this transformation? The thing on the left-hand side is at some point in space and time. The argument on the right-hand side is at the point where we perform the reflection of time. So if this is at t and xi, this is at minus t and xi with Lorentzian signature. And we, there's a counterpart in Euclidean signature. Also, we view all the gauge fields, either the dynamical ones, these two, or the classical one, this one, as differential forms which means that the zeroth component 
of the differential form. And the space component transform with opposite signs. So this thing B is really B0 dx0. I'm using Lorentzian signature, and here I use Euclidean signature. I hope you will not be confused by that. And therefore, since I have a minus sign here and another minus sign from x0, this means that t of b0 is b0, and t of bi is minus bi. And similarly for all the others. This means that the zeroth component or the time component of the gauge field is, in, is even on the time reversal. This is the convention we took. And the spatial component is odd on the time reversal. This is the standard conventions for electromagnetism that people often use. Time <coughs> reversal does not reflect electric charge. Time reversal does reflect magnetic charge, but not electric charge. So this is a plus. So the logic is time of our convention is that time reversal does not reverse electric charge. That's why we have a plus sign here. And that gives us a minus sign here. And that propagates through all the others. Then you can take this change of variables and plug it into the Lagrangian. This Lagrangian, this is a straightforward exercise. And you find that T of the Lagrangian is minus the Lagrangian minus I over 4 pi BdB. So first, let's set big B to 0 so we don't have this term. So why do I say that this is a symmetry even though the Lagrangian flip sign? So somebody asked me that question. We have a minus sign here. That's actually the correct statement for time reversal symmetry. Because the, in the previous lecture, I even said that I'm a little bit careless in the notation. The question is whether the Lagrangian is a density or a form. And in this lecture, the Lagrangian is a, den is a form. So it includes a dx0. So that's correct, this minus sign here. So this is the correct sign for, for something to, to transform under time reversal. Sorry? For, yeah, so for big B equals 0, for big B equals 0, the system is, Lorent is time reversal invariant. That by itself is a bit surprising. Because if you looked at that, imagine you said B to 0 everywhere here. This thing and this thing does not look time reversal invariant. But there is a time reversal symmetry that mixes B and C in a non-trivial way, in precisely that way, and preserves time reversal. Yes? You can also make uh, the field strength of uh, B to 0 without, uh, while keeping the Lagrangian uh, time reversal invariant. That's right. We can even set, imagine DB is 0, and it will also be time reversal invariant. But since you brought it up, the next question is, what does it mean for time reversal when B is not 0? We turn background field for B, and now the system is not time reversal invariant. So without, the time, without background B, when big B is 0, the system has a symmetry. But when B is not 0, the system does not have the symmetry. Who knows what this is called? I think I heard the, the right answer. That's what's called an anomaly. An anomaly is the statement that when we couple the system to background fields, without the background fields, the symmetry is there. But with, with background fields, the symmetry is not there. But notice the consistency check. The change in the Lagrangian, this thing, is a well-defined term in the theory. 1 over 4 pi is the correct normalization to be well-defined in such spin theories. So one might say, oh, that's easy. All we need to do is split it, call it 1 over 8 pi, put 1 over 8 pi here, 1 over 8 pi here, and find a Lagrangian, which is time reversal invariant. But that's not allowed. That's not allowed because 1 over 8 pi is not the correct normalization. So then again, this is characteristic of anomalies. The anomaly is such that when we perform the transformation, the Lagrangian is shifted by what we can call a counter term, a properly normalized counter term. So that's good. But it's a counter term that in such a way that we cannot absorb it in redefinition of the Lagrangian. 
could absorb it in redefinition of the Lagrangian, we will not call it an anomaly. What does it affect? If B is zero, all the correlation functions, everything is time reversal invariant. In that sense, the symmetry is there. What is not there? Various contact terms are not there. Or equivalently, if we turn on background big B. If background big B is, is non-zero, then the partition function is not going to be invariant under time reversal. So what are we going to do about that? So there are various things we can do. One, say, just live with it. Say, the system does not have, the partition function is invariant under U1, but does not have time reversal symmetry. That's the end. The partition function, if we reverse the orientation, is multiplied by e to, the, to this factor. Option two, to say, no, we really love time reversal. And therefore, we do not, we want to remove this term. And in order to remove this term, we might want to put various factors of two here and there. I'll do it in more detail later. In such a way that we'll change the U1 periodicity such that this would be a valid term. The third thing to do, which is perhaps the most interesting, is to say that our three manifold is a boundary of a four manifold. And then write this term. Uh, and then write the Lagrangian is, is the Lagrangian we wrote integral over M3. So the action would be the Lagrangian that we wrote before, plus I over 8 pi, integral over M4, I, in my convention should be plus dB, dB. So one might want to write that as B dB on M3 with coefficient 1 over 8 pi. That would fix this problem here. However, then it's not properly normalized. In other words, this expression that we write, if we use different M4s, which are different M3, is the boundary of M4. So if we take different M4s, or the same M4 with different extrapolation of <coughs> big B to the bulk, this term depends on the choice of M4 and on the choice of extrapolation of B into four dimensions. So this system, as it stands, depends on what happens in the bulk. So this is a huge price to pay. What we get in return is that it has the U1 symmetry, and it is time reversal invariant. So to recapitulate, the system, this system, this innocent-looking system, has classically time reversal symmetry. If we couple background fields for U1, we see a mixed anomaly between time reversal and the U1. And the anomaly is precisely this minimal amount. We cannot add any term here to kill it. And therefore, that's an anomaly. And one way to fix it is to attach it to a bulk. The bulk allows us to add on the boundary improperly quantized churn simons terms. But this is really a perverse way of saying it. The bulk allows us to write properly normalized terms in the bulk that depend on what happens in the bulk. OK, so these are the additions I wanted to make about this point. And now I'm why, why do you distinguish these last two? Which two? Uh, the one that you just said. The first one is, is not meaningful. The second is. A not, normal, a not properly normalized churn, you can define a non properly normalized churn Simons term as what you would get if you attach a bulk and, and write meaningful term in the bulk. You can use that as a definition. As it stands, it's not well defined. Why are you calling this term? Yeah. So, roughly speaking, I can say that this is, I'll often use the notation i over 8 pi integral over m3 of bdb. And then you can call it a, an improperly tr normalized churn simons term. But what I really mean by that, that's ill-defined. What I really mean by this is this. In fact, what I really mean by, as I emphasized last time, is what I really mean by all these three terms is really to define them using a bulk. So we define them using a bulk. So we define everything using a bulk. For these terms, 
what we write is independent of what's going on in the bulk, and therefore it is a genuinely three-dimensional problem. This last term, we cannot do it. It depends on what happens in the bulk. So either we add this term, it depends on what happens in the bulk, and we have time reversal symmetry, or we don't add this term, and then we don't have time reversal symmetry. And these are different systems. Both are valid. Now, often you will see in the literature expressions like this without specifying the bulk, and that's just wrong. OK, so for me, uh, the Lagrangian has some terms. And we couple it to background fields. And we can also add properly normalized terms that depend on the counter terms. So the Lagrangian is a functional of dynamical fields and classical fields. The dynamical fields are the fields that we integrate over. They are quantum objects. The classical fields have values. We do not integrate over them. So when we ask what's the partition function, the partition function is the result of doing the integral over the dynamical fields. And it's a functional of the classical fields. And the theory depends both on the coefficients in the Lagrangian for the dynamical fields, but also the answer depends on the coefficients of the classical terms, which are referred to as counter term. I think there was a question here at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a little bit confused for that because this whole section is <coughs> talking about how the Z1 symmetry has a mixed anomaly. Right. So it has mixed anomaly with this term. So there's a more, a more precise way of saying it, where the, this system really has a one form global symmetry. I didn't want to get into it. This thing is kind of a two form. And you can think of it as a background field for the one form global symmetry. And I know exactly. Let me finish the sentence, even though you already understand that. And then, this is a particular value for the one-form global symmetry uh, that depends on an ordinary gauge field B. And if you didn't follow this thing because you did not, you're not experts in one-form symmetries, I can refer you to the literature on higher-form symmetries. So how badly does this thing depend on the choice of continuation to the bottom? It's only a sign. It's only a sign. Why is it only a sign? Because you see, this is a phase. So if we put here an, a 4, that would be a good, a good term. right? So what does it mean? It means that the square of this, so OK? So because. If we put a 4 here, it will always be 1. So we have to take a square root, so it's only plus 1. So it almost doesn't depend on the choice of b. So if I make small changes in b, so I have a generic b, and make small changes, it doesn't change. But occasionally, it could jump from plus 1 and minus 1. I'll give more examples of that later. You could have added also a BDC. Uh, I could have added another field. It could even be a, a b prime. So that's an excellent question. So I leave it as an exercise for you. Add here another gauge field that couples to C, call it the B prime, and generalize this. So depend also on B prime. And also, what is the specialness of this time reversal? Why is it so important? What physical properties are very different if the theory is or is not? Well, there was, there's a long list of Nobel Prizes for people who well, discuss. Precisely in this context. In closely related contexts. Uh, even in top logic, there isn't a field prize yet. I predict there will be at some point. <laughs> <laughs> so in relativistic theories, time reversal is the same as CP. And the violation of CP has a very long and interesting history with some Nobel Prizes and some other great work which did not get a Nobel Prize. And in condensed matter physics, time reversal symmetry and CP are not exactly the same because they're not relativistic. In systems that are or are not time reversal invariant, that's a big deal. For example, if you have a magnetic field, it's not time reversal invariant. If you have a system without a magnetic field, it is time reversal invariant, and so what forth. About that we can also discuss that. We can also discuss. There are lots of symmetries the that we. Are no. 
So this one, I this one actually is, because it's relativistic and it has t, so it has some p. But in general, you can have one or the other. And we'll have more to say about that later in the talk today. Because we would like to say that the answer is, first of all, it's an excellent question. We would like to compute the partition function. What is the partition function? So the partition function z is an integral over all possible b's and all possible c's e to the minus the integral over the Lagrangian. And what is it a function of? It should be a functional of b. What does it mean? We specified b in three dimensions. And we'd like to get an answer that depends on b in three dimensions. And it should be meaningful. It should be gauge invariant and meaningful. And it is, but it's not time reversal invariant. If we add this four-dimensional term, it's meaningful and time reversal invariant. But it depends on what happens in the bulk. So if even here somebody asked me, how bad is it? And I said that it bad, it's bad only plus or minus sign. So the lack of this to be, if, if we don't add the bulk term, we just view it as a three-dimensional theory, this z could fail to be time reversal invariant only by a sign. So it's not that bad, but it's bad enough so that this system is not time reversal invariant. We'll soon have more examples of this. So the nice thing here is that we can see, first of all, it's topological field theory, and it has time reversal invariant, which is surprising. But we can see it very, very explicitly, both the time reversal symmetry and the anomaly in that symmetry. And it's all visible classically. Right? There's no fancy determinant or something subtle statements like, oh, it depends on the regularization. There are all sorts of things that you hear about anomalies. You need to have fermions. It depends on regularization. There are all sorts of words. None of that exists here. You can see it all kind of classically here. Any more questions about this? <coughs> yeah, I'm going very slowly. I'd like to bring up, so change topic a little bit in preparation for the next one. So I was asked about that in the tutorial, but I will extend the answer I gave in the tutorial now. So we are changing topic. and we one crucial thing that will be important later in this, these talks is when we have a system, we would like to understand its symmetries, its global symmetries, and its tooth anomalies. And as you see from this example, we add to the system classical background fields. We couple the system to classical background fields. And we ask, what is the dependence on the, of the partition function of, or correlation functions on the background fields? That's what we should do. And just as we put it, with some turn on background field B, we could also turn on some metric. And we can place the system on a complicated manifold. So somebody could say, you know, I'm a condensed matter physicist. I have my lab sitting in some room here. I'm essentially, <coughs> space is R3. Why are you bothering me with all this complicated topology? Who cares what the system would do on a complicated manifold? After all, what I have in the lab is some system here on R3. I'm not interested in the answer on other topologies. The point is, it's very much like in a Tooth's story of the anomaly. We couple the system to background fields. We study the system as a functional of these background fields. And we get some answer. And the answer has to be consistent. And if it fails to be consistent in a particular way, it gives us a consistency condition on what the answer could be. So if we we start from some Hamiltonian, and we guess what the low energy dynamics would be. The low energy dynamics should have exactly the same anomaly as the short distance theory. This was Tuft's original argument. And we could do the same thing also with gravity. So even though you're not interested in what happens when you put your Hamiltonian of some spins with a lattice on a complicated manifold, this is a theoretical question that you could ask. And if you realize that you cannot put your Hamiltonian, you cannot preserve all its symmetries and so forth on particular space, on particular space manifolds or even space-time manifolds, then the same obstruction should also exist in the answer. In other words, it's very important 
when we study quantum field theory, not to limit ourselves to a particular manifold. We should study the quantum field theory on every possible manifold. It might or might not have a spin structure and so forth. But we should study the quantum field theory on all possible manifolds with all possible background fields. In the end of the day, we'll, we'll go back to R3. But the complicated manifolds, so we'll formulate the question on a complicated manifold. Then we'll get the answer on the same complicated manifold. And if the question can be formulated consistently on some manifold, so should be the answer. So that's why I talked yes, uh, last time about formulating the theory on a spin manifold or a non-spin manifold. So if we can formulate the theory at short distances only on spin manifolds, the answer, what happens at long distances is the answer. What happens at short distances is the question. At long distances, we should get something that should be consistent on spin manifolds. And it might or might not be consistent on non-spin manifolds. If, conversely, the short distance theory makes sense on both spin and non-spin manifolds, or it's on spin manifolds, it's independent of the choice of spin structure, the same th should be true for the answer. Because if the question does not depend on the choice of spin structure, the answer should better be independent of the choice of spin structure. So now we are going to generalize this. And it's again in the spirit of a tuft. We are going to put the system. Some, some systems can be placed on more subtle manifolds, more subtle situations. And that is a powerful constraint on the long distance dynamics. And this thing has a long history both in math and in physics. So I'll first say the physics the motivation. Imagine you have a system of electrons that interact in some complicated way. And let's ignore the ions for, that, for this problem. Then we have some fermions with charge 1. We can also form various bosons, like product of two electrons. That's a boson. Or electron anti-electron, electron in a hole. That's also a boson. So it's clear that all the fermions in the problem have odd electric charge. And all the bosons in the problem have even magnetic charge. That's a selection rule. And it's called the spin charge relation. So the spin charge relation, not every system has it. But if our system is such that it has the spin charge relation, that's the statement that all even all odd particle, all odd charged particles are fermions, have half integer spin, and all even charged particles are bosons. It's obvious from that that if you keep multiplying them and you let them interact and do this and that, the same should always remain true. So if this is true at short distances, the long distance theory should also have this property. Now, that leads, that means that our system is not at any random system of spinners. So if we just have spinners or fermions, then we should be able to formulate the theory on a spin manifold. But and it depends on the choice of spin structure. But it might not be consistent to formulate the theory on a non-spin manifold. So what's a non-spin manifold? A non-spin manifold, any number of dimensions. Anions are not fields in the Lagrangian. Right, but still, uh, well, they are. Put together um, anions and, uh, they, have spin they are not spins in the Lagrangian. Okay. So I formulate the theory at short distances. At short distances, I write the Lagrangian. I have a Hamiltonian with spins, they interact, and so forth. All the fundamental fields are either bosons or fermions. The outcome could have anions. That would be an interesting outcome. We'll see how this effect that at short distances, they have, we have this spin charge relation, how this manifests itself with the anions, if we have anions in the end of the day. But at short distances, we have electrons on a lattice, and they interact, and they hop from side to side, and they attract each other or repel each other, and so forth. It could be a very complicated Lagrangian, but it has this selection rule. So what is a manifold that is not spin? It is characterized by something called W2, the second Stiefel-Whitney class. And the second Stiefel-Whitney class is either 0 or 1. 0 or 1. It's defined mod 2. If it's 0, it means that we can define spinners around the corresponding 2 cycle. If it's non-zero, it means that we cannot define spinners. And this is we go around, we pick minus signs which are problematic. Now imagine we couple the system to background fields. So when we couple the system to background fields, 
we can have magnetic flux. What does the magnetic flux tell us? It tells us that if we take a, a charged particle and, and we have, say, a sphere or a torus, the magnetic flux is properly quantized. As I take the charged particle around the closed loop, I'm not going to detect a Dirac string. In fact, Dirac went out of his way to hide the Dirac string. He understood that when the flux is 2 pi, and we have a magnetic monopole, there has to be a Dirac string. But if the flux is exactly 2 pi, the Dirac string is not visible. So if, the flux, if this is an integer, everything is OK. But imagine this is half integer. We say a half. So imagine I have a sphere in my space time that has half integer flux. Three. That's not OK. Why isn't it OK? Because it has a Dirac string emanating from it. And if I take the charged particle around it, the wave function will pick a minus sign. So that's not allowed. But imagine now that we correlate this and that. And we say that the integral, so we don't want that. But imagine that the integral of dA over 2 pi, let me get, I don't want, okay. this is a half of the integral over the same cycle of W2 modulo an integer. So what happens? Now we say that the magnetic flux can be a half, can be an integer of, or half integer. If the magnetic flux is a half through some cycle and the spinners cannot be defined, the mistake from here cancels the mistake from here and the Dirac string is not visible. In other words, as I take a fermion which is charged and I take it around this would-be Dirac string, I get a minus sign because it's charged and I get a minus sign from the spin and together they cancel each other and therefore this is a valid configuration. So if we have a spin manifold, the right hand side is always, uh, the integral of W2 is, is the, the integral of W2 is 0, so the left, the, this is 0, and then all the fluxes are integers. That's the case we discussed before. But now we say, wait a minute, even if we don't have a spin manifold, we can still get away with it. If we don't have a spin manifold, we'll specify A such that of all the good cycles, all the cycles where we can define spinners, the flux is an integer, and through all the bad cycles where we could not define spinners, we'll put half integer magnetic flux so that the two cancel each other. This means that if we specify, we take a non-spin manifold, which has these bad cycles, and we specify an appropriate gauge field, this A, then we can still get away with it. So now this looks like a very perverse thing to do. We have a system of electrons. So first I said, we want to put it on a complicated manifold, but since there's a spinners, it should better be a spin manifold. But now we see that we can also put it on non-spin manifolds, provided we turn on this flux. That's good, because now we can put the system on non-spin manifolds. This is a property of the question. This is what happens at short distances. And then we use a tooth, and it tells us the same thing should also happen at long distances. So the long distance theory should also be such that it can be defined on non-spin manifolds. Furthermore, if A is classical, then A, the classical one appears at long distances. So the same property should also be, whole, should be cons the long distance theory should be consistent with that. So I just have to add only one thing. This is not an ordinary gauge field, this A. It's not an ordinary U1 gauge field because it does have half integer fluxes. But the fluxes, the, those cycles where it's half integer, are not random. This is correlated by the geometry. So the, there's some geometry which specifies W2. And now we come with this A. And with all the good cycles, we put some integer flux, arbitrary integer. And for all these bad cycles, we put half integer, could be half or three half or minus a half, etc. flux. And such a gauge field, A, is called a spin C connection. So now, I said before that all the dynamical fields will be lowercase and all the classical fields will be uppercase fields. 
And I deliberately did not use the character A, because, and I said that I reserve A for later. So A will be reserved for spin C connections. If it's uppercase, it's classical. And if it's lowercase, it will be dynamical. So now we'll go back to the churn simons theory, or to the topological field theory. And for simplicity, we'll take it to be a billion. Yes? Yeah, in four dimensions it can. But above four dimensions, I, I believe the answer is no, but I'm not sure. I, in th yeah. Would I, if you can do it always in 4D, you always can do that in 3D. Just add another. Yes, it's closely related. Uh, well, it's a special case. Yeah, yeah. A yes, but this is a kind of overkill for this prism. This thing appears in many places. So here I motivated it by what in condensed matter physics is called the spin charge relation. So it's again, we have a selection rule of short distances. This is a more mathematical way of implementing carefully the selection rule. And it's in the, again in the sense of a tooth that we would like to ter be able to place the theory on on as many back in, with as many backgrounds as possible. So there's a new kind of background that we can put the system in, and therefore we get more consistency conditions. There were two questions here. Did you both ask? Or are oh, you both asked? Good. So I'm just going to write the answer of what the allowed terms in churn simons theory that we can write down. So if we have, so first of all, general comment, if we have a spin, connect, spin C connection A, and B, I are ordinary U1 gauge fields. If I have a bunch of them, without loss of generality, I can say that only one of them is spin C. All the others are ordinary U1 fields. Why? Because if A is a spin C connection, then A plus B is also a spin C connection. And if you have two spin, con spin C connections, A and A prime, then A minus A prime is an ordinary U1 gauge field. Because one of them has a half, the other has a half. The difference between them is they canceled. So that's an ordinary U1 gauge field. So without loss of generality, I can always pick a basis such that one of them is spin C, A, and the rest are U1. So then the allowed terms that we can write are of this form. We can write Kij, Bi, Dbj over 4 pi plus qi over 2 pi di da. And we can write k hat over 4 pi a da. And we can also write a gravitational churn simons term, which is 2k hat plus 16n. I'll soon define the notation with the gravitational churn simons term. And the gravitational churn simons term is defined with all the normalization so that the integral of churn simons over a three manifold is 1 over 192, 192 pi integral over the four manifold. This is the boundary of the four manifold. Trace R wage R. So now all the normalizations are in front of you. And if M4 is closed, 192 pi trace R wedge R is pi over 8, pi over 8 times what's called the signature. So now all the definitions are on the blackboard. And now we just have to say what the conditions are. We would like this to be consistent with the spin charge relation. So let's first look at the Bs. So this is a generalization of the case we discussed before. Before we discussed the case with a single B. So now I'll write an allowed, I allow an arbitrary K matrix, an arbitrary matrix here. So the conditions are that all Kij, Qi, K hat, and N must be integers. And Kii, the diagonal one, a Qi mod 2. So the diagonal elements could be one, or could be even or odd. If they are even, this should be even. If this is odd, this should be odd. 
And that's it. And we are allowed to put any arbitrary coefficients here to be consistent. Now let's make it, let's consider an example. Imagine there's only one B. So the off-diagonal term doesn't, uh, doesn't exist. We have only the diagonal one. So if we want to have 1 over 4 pi b db, we should better have a coupling like that, 1 over 2 pi b d a. So this is consistent on an arbitrary spin c manifold. So this theory, I said, needs a choice of spin structure. And, but together, if I take this and that and let A be such a spin C connection, together they form a consistent combination. This will give us powerful constraint later when we discuss dynamics. And a combination that is a nice to consider, which will appear often, is the coefficient of k hat here. So I'm going to define I, which is a function of the metric in A, is 1 over 4 pi a d a plus twice the, trans, the gravitational trans Simons term. And this linear combination is well defined on a spin C manifold. If, now, if you did not follow what I've just said on spin C, don't worry. Limit yourself to only spin manifolds. You will not get the full power of this constraint. But it will not stop you from understanding the rest of the lectures. So you can ask questions now about this. Uh, don't panic if you didn't follow that. You panicked so Yeah, thank you. Sorry? This one? This is independent of dynamics. This is geometry. We specify a classical gauge field A on a classical manifold with some metric which has non spins so which which is non spin so it has non trivial cycles this tells you how to correlate the flux of a with the cycles in the geometry this these are well defined terms that we can write down this is there's no dynamics here this is a, a statement about geometry or topology. These, are, these terms are allowed terms, and they are meaningful <laughs> on non-spin manifolds which have this spin sh structure. So these are the, I'm just summarizing here what is allowed. So this term by itself is not meaningful. If this manifold, if the, it's meaningful if the manifold is spin, but it's not meaningful if it's not spin. Similarly, this term. But this linear combination, the mistake from here cancels the mistake from there. So I'm just stating it as facts. I could give a much longer lecture where I derive these facts. Yes? Gravitational churn Simon. So it's kind of a, it's very much like this. It's a omega d omega that comes from writing the trace of Jar. In view of the time, from this point on, I'm going to suppress all gravitational trans Simons term. They are there, and they can be found in the, pa in the references I gave. So I'm going to suppress them. And I will mention spin C, but if you find that too scary, limit yourself to spin manifolds. You lose a lot of the information, but you can still follow the discussion. So that's a deal. If you ask, I'm happy to do more. So I'm going to change gears now. And I would like to discuss Fermi. So I'm following this quantum field theory order, quantum field theory course. We started with bosons. We discussed the Wilson-Fisher theory. We added gauge, the U1 gauge field. And we discussed the gauge Wilson-Fisher theory. And it's the duality between them. Then we did a little bit of work with gauge fields and churn simons terms. And the other last ingredient is fermions. And there is a general rule about quantum field theory. Whenever you're confused about quantum field theory, go back to quantum mechanics, get your conventions and understanding straight there. And once you understand it in quantum mechanics, you're ready to graduate to quantum field theory. So I'm going to have a warm-up now of a complex free fermion in quantum mechanics. 
I'll describe the Lagrangian, the Hilbert space, how the symmetries act, and so forth. And I will also set my convention straight here, and then I'll move to three dimensions. <coughs> Questions before I start? Free fermion. So psi is a complex fermion in quantum mechanics. What is its spin? Can anybody tell me? What's the spin of psi? Any answer? Who said a half? That's not the right answer. <laughs> Sorry, it's a fermion in quantum mechanics. What's the spin of the fermion in quantum mechanics? That's better. Or either zero or not well defined. There's no spin in quantum mechanics. Good. So some people are alert. <laughs> and you write a Lagrangian. So psi is a complex number. Of course, it's a Grassmann number, but it's, it's one component. What conditions should, yes? Explain what? Well, it, you need to rotate around something to have spin. And there's nothing to rotate around. Quantum mechanics, we have only time. You can re <coughs> re rotate the target space, but that acts as an internal symmetry in quantum mechanics. The Lorentz group is, is rather trivial in quantum mechanics. Right? You can't even boost. You cannot translate, because there's no space. Right? There's only time. There's time translation. That's part of the Poincaré, but there's no rotation, no boost or anything. Because there's, there's, the there's a Hilbert space, yeah, but there's no... <coughs> space. That's true, but that's not what's called rot the rotation group. Of, that's not part of the Lorentz group. The, the word space is used for both, but it's kind of, and mathematically it's correct, but in this particular case these are different spaces. There's no space in quantum mechanics. So what's the Lagrangian? The condition on the Lagrangian, so now I'll be in Lorentzian signature. I'll move back and forth between uh, Lorentzian signatures and different signatures of space-time. So I'm having a kinetic term. So A is a classical background field. Why does I not happen in the first class? Because I was wrong. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. This is a psi. So now, thank you. This was a transparent fermion. You didn't see. So what do we see here? So A is a background field, so we can first turn it to set it to zero. The system has a U1 symmetry that rotates psi by a phase. So A0 is a background field <coughs> for that symmetry. This is a term that depends on the, only on the background fields. And as such, I refer to it as a counter term, the same way I did before. I can set it to 0. That would mean that k is 0. But more generally, I can have an arbitrary k, which is an integer. I also don't have any gamma zero. Notice that the kinetic term does not have a slash because gamma zero is one, so I don't need to write it. And there is a U1 charge. What is the generator of the U1 charge, the U1 transformation? There's a U1 that rotates psi by a phase. So there are two ways of thinking about it. One is what is the operator whose commutation relations with psi are the right one? So you can say this is psi dagger psi, so electric charge is that. But there's another more precise way of thinking about it and say that the electric charge is the variation of the Lagrangian with respect to A0. And therefore, there is a constant here, plus k, that comes from this term. This constant here is not that exciting in the quantum mechanics problem because it's a C number, so it commutes with everything. So this k commutes with everything and and therefore, it's not that exciting, but it sits here, and it corrects what we mean by Q. And when we act on states, it makes a difference. We also have some discrete symmetries. And I'll make a big deal out of the discrete symmetries later in the, in the course. So let's get the discrete symmetries straight. There is charge conjugation that maps psi to psi dagger. It maps psi dagger to psi. 
And let me act also on the background fields. So I can say that C on A0 is minus A0. It reverses the electric charge. And I leave it as an exercise for you to find out how it acts on the, these background parameters. So that would be an exercise to fill in these two question marks. Now, I got to say that throughout my life, I always ignored these discrete symmetries. I was always very confused, especially with time reversal. Sorry? Isai, yep, thank you. I keep making mistakes, and I'm happy that you correct me. And this shouldn't be here. <coughs> now it's much better. I hope there are no other mistakes. So my, some personal comments. I always was confused about discrete symmetries. And I always felt that I don't really need to understand that because, after all, it's just some algebra, you know, and you can always, I can always go back and just repeat the algebra and it, get it to work. And it was particularly confusing with time reversal symmetry for a number of reasons. One of them is it's anti-unitary, and that somehow always bothered me. I had some problem with that. And honestly, I could never understand why how to work with anti-unitary transformations. And I always thought also that it's not important because because of C CPT, I can always just work with CP, and therefore I don't need to understand time reversal. So over the last few years, I realized that that view of mine was completely wrong. And I'd like to share with you my current understanding of time reversal. And you will see that it's full of subtle things, but it's worth getting straight. So this is time reversal, and we'll start in quantum mechanics. Time reversal reverses the direction of time, and that's why it has to be anti-unitary. And you can see that already from the Schrodinger equation. It's i d by dt, psi, etc. If we take t to minus t, we should also change the direction of the i that sits there. But that's always confusing, because if we want to ask, what's t of psi? So if we have t here, Whatever would be on the other side will have t in it. But what should we write here? Should we write psi or psi dagger? After all, it's anti-unitary, should reverse i. So should we or should we, how, how should we act on something which is not real with time reversal? So there's a general rule that is always good to remember. When you're confused about complex numbers, you should write them in terms of real numbers. And there's an explicit i. So we're going to use often the notation that psi is psi 1 plus i psi 2. So psi 1 and psi 2 are real operators. And therefore, when we act with t, we are going to get one minus sign from the i here. So that's an i that this is a minus sign that will be crucial later in the talks. So what should I write here? Should I write psi or psi dagger? I could actually write whatever I want. So I'll make a choice calling it psi. The difference between them, so I made this choice, you made the opposite choice, which is equally valid. But what's the difference between us? The difference between us, look at this C. What does C do? C is a unitary transformation. It commutes with time. It maps psi to psi dagger, and therefore it maps psi 1 to itself, and psi 2 to minus itself. So the difference between your t and my t is that what you call t, I would call ct. And I will suppress the argument at flip sign. I've already mentioned it in the first lecture, that there is an ambiguity which one is t and which one is ct. And the ambiguity became very visible in this lecture. Because your choice was one and my choice was the other. Why do I prefer my choice? I prefer my choice because electric charge is time reversal even. That's why I prefer this choice. You will soon see that this is not a good argument. There is no good argument to prefer one over the other. And we should remember both. So let's fill in the table. So T of psi dagger is what in this convention? dagger. Notice that it does not change the electric charge. 
because T on, the, on, the, on charge 1 is charge 1, not charge minus 1. And what's T on A0? These are commas. What's T on A0? A0. And they are good. One way of saying it is there are two I's. Another way of saying it, we declare that T does not change electric charge. So A0 should still couple correctly. So, so far, so good. And I'm leaving it as an exercise for you to find T on M and T on K. And now let's fill in the table. So CT of psi dagger is what? Psi, good. And what's CT on A0? Sorry? Minus A0. And what about these? Well, the answer is that I'm leaving it as an exercise. Ah, excellent question. All parameters, you can act on them. What does it mean? I insist that the Lagrangian is invariant. And therefore, in order to correct, the, the, it multiplies an operator or a C number. If the C number transforms, I'll transform the <coughs> parameter accordingly. So this way, I can characterize how the symmetry is broken. Having said that, I would say that you complained about M and K because they're parameters. You should have complained also about A0, because A0 is also classical. So in fact, A0, M, and K are on equal footing. They're all classical objects. Not me. I didn't invent Spurion analysis. I, I like to use this. The answer is yes, except that I didn't invent it. I don't deserve any credit for this. Now, what algebra do these guys satisfy? So we'll get some practice with these anti-unitary symmetries. What's T square? So we act once. We find psi minus T. We act again. It's still psi, but now back at t. And therefore, it's 1. And you can check that it's always 1. What about c square? That's easy. That's 1. And what about c t square? It's also 1. You can also check that c and t commute. So that's very easy. Now, somebody might feel uncomfortable. Because we often see that t square is not 1, but minus 1 to the f. So how come we got 1 here and not minus 1 to the f? Sorry? Well, there are fermions in quantum mechanics. So both are correct. So let me show you that both are correct. T and elect we defined Q over there, the electric charge. And Q is commutes with T. Why is that? That's because we define T to be such that it preserves electric charge. So T commutes with T. Now let's compute T e to the i alpha q. So t, com t commutes with q, but it reverses the i. So it's e to the minus i alpha q times t. So even though t commutes with electric charge, it does not commute with the charge rotation because of this i. On the contrary, CT with e to the i alpha q is e to the i alpha q CT. So my T commutes with Q, but does not commute with e to the i alpha q. Your Q, your T, which is my CT, does not commute with Q, but on the other hand, it commutes with e to the i alpha q. So I'm now going to define T tilde which is ct 
e to the i pi over 2q. What is this? This is an operator. It's anti-unitary because it has a t here. It reverses the direction of time. So you had one choice of t, and I had another choice of t. Remind me your name again? Talia. Talia. It starts with t, so that's good. <laughs> so your t is my ct, but Talia's t is my ct. And somebody else could have said, wait a minute, why don't we define t, this to be time reversal, t tilde. <coughs> Exercise for you, show that this is actually a good choice, because this is the same as e to the i pi q, which is the same as minus 1 to the fermion number. So the algebra of operators that I define, my t and my c and my q, really generate everything. And if you like a time reversal transformation that squares to 1, that's mine or Talia's. And if you want one that squares to minus 1 to the f, it's also there. You can make many choices. There are many choices. And every one of them has advantages and disadvantages. But one thing that is important, make a choice and stick with it, because otherwise you'll get in trouble. So now we're going to the quantum mechanics. So far, everything was just, just analyze the classical system. So the quantization of this system is well known. How many states are there in the Hilbert space? Two. So this is a two-level system. And until recently, it was called Q two-level system. But these days, people want to be fancy. They call it a qubit. <laughs> so that's a qubit. And there are two states. So one of them I'll call k, and the other I'll call k plus 1. And I can think of sine, psi, dagger as being creation and annihilation operators. So psi dagger is the creation operator on this state is that. And psi on k is 0. And psi dagger on k plus 1 is 0. And I claim that this level k, so now we can ask, I defined q before, the electric charge. So I leave it as an exercise for you to check that the electric charge of this state is k. So I define the shift by k of the, in the electric charge operator such that this will really be the charge of this state. Now comes a crucial point. U1 is an, uh, A0 is an arbitrary background field. It's, an A's, it's a U1 background field. <laughs> so if space-time, Euclidean space-time is a circle, we can perform large gate transformations that wind around the circle. They, shift A0, they can shift A0 by total derivative, but the total derivative should be such that it integrates to 0, and that quantizes k to be an integer. So k should be an integer. But if k is an integer, this Hilbert space does not, does not rep respect c. c does not act well on the Hilbert space. So you could say, well, maybe we could choose another value of k. So in general, it doesn't have to act well. But is there a choice of k? We still have freedom to change k. Is there a choice of k such that the Hilbert space will respect c? We like c will change k to minus k. So if we take k to 0, this state would be invariant under C, but this state will not transform properly. If we set k to minus 1, this state will work well, but this state will not. So somebody could say, ha, ah, how about k equals a half, or minus a half in this case? If k is minus a half, that's good. C will exchange these two, but it will not respect the u1. It will respect the double cover of that u1, but it will not respect the u1. Now, this is something that Wigner understood. Wigner understood that the Hilbert space does not have to respect the symmetries of the system. The classical system, which I wrote somewhere here. Where did I write it? Here. This classical Lagrangian has a u1 symmetry. How did this happen? So this system has a global u1 symmetry. 
is a global U1 symmetry. All the operators are in representations of U1. All the operators have well-defined U1 charge. So it looks like everything is good, but the Hilbert space does not respect U1 in C. It re U1 in C are represented projectively. So option one, this is something that Wigner understood. It's not new. The generalization of this to higher dimensions, therefore this can also be called an anomaly, but in quantum mechanics, this is an old story. So if we insist on preserving C, we'll choose K here to be a half, and if K is a half, the Hilbert space represents the U1 projectively. If I'm doing a U1 transformation by e to the 2 pi iq, the Hilbert space picks a minus sign. If, conversely, we insist on preserving the U1, then the charges of the state should be integers, and then we cannot, specify, we cannot have C. We cannot have char charge conjugation. So we have, in <coughs> one term, it's called a mixed anomaly between C and Q. And I actually learned that story from three members in the audience when I was a graduate student. Which shows you how all these ideas are. <laughs> so before we encounter a similar thing in the quantum in in Chern Simons theories, where again we had some symmetries and we wanted to preserve them, but we couldn't. So we could either sacrifice one thing or sacrifice something else. And we showed that there is a third option. The third option is to add a bulk. So I'm going to do the same thing here. Let's add the bulk. So this is time, our quantum mechanics time. Let it be even Euclidean time. And let it even be compact. It goes here. And I'm going to add a bulk, which is a two-dimensional manifold. It can have handles and so forth. Now I can add in the bulk a term which is a half dA, m2, and this is m1, is our quantum mechanical system. It's the boundary. It, I can assume that it's, co it's compact, but I don't have to. Let it be compact, and then we can always take the size to infinity. So it's Euclidean and compact. And, but then we can take the size to infinity, and then we can even rot rotate it to a Lorentzian signature. I worked in Lorentzian signature, so now I'm temporarily switching to Euclidean signature. But the answer, I'll write the answer now is if I'm in Lorentzian signature. I can go back and forth. So I'm adding a bulk. And in the bulk, in two dimensions, the bulk is two-dimensional, I can actually now mimic a k equals a half without breaking the U1 symmetry. The same thing I did before in three dimensions. So writing this term, I can also write that as theta over 2 pi, over pi, over 2 pi, time integral dA, and put here another a p pump. I think I want this. So this is the standard theta term. And I'm setting the standard theta term to pi. So a theta equals pi in the bulk leads to what we can call k effective equals a half on the boundary. So now I can preserve all the symmetries. I can preserve the u1. Oh, everything is nice and u1 invariant. I also preserve charge conjugation. A theta equals pi. This term is, time, is charge conjugation invariant. Charge conjugation changes the direction of sine of a. So it shifts theta to minus theta. But the theta equals pi. If pi to minus pi and minus pi is the same as pi, you do the theta periodicity. The price we pay, the price we pay is that it depends on what happens in the bulk. So it's very similar to what we saw before. And before I finish all my series of talks, you will see that many more times. And you will see that it's always the same story. Couple to background fields, we try to preserve the symmetries. We cannot preserve all the symmetries. So we either preserve one or the other. Or we add a bulk, and then we can preserve all the symmetries, but the answer depends on the bulk. <coughs> I'm sorry. Can you just explain again what's the problem with, um, with C at K equals a half? No, there's no problem with C, but there's so a problem with U1. Yeah. U, the U1. If I act with E to the 2 pi IQ, that should have been 1. 
because oh, that's how u1 is defined. But it's not. If k is a half, there are, there are states with half integer charge. No, so the general rule is dynamical fields live only on the boundary. Classical fields live on the bulk, can live on the bulk. They might or might not. So if theta is 2 pi, I can write this term, but it will be independent of what happens in the bulk. That would be nice. But in this case, we don't have this luxury. So you expect that you can't add some other terms in the Lagrangian that will uh, to cancel to this uh, anomaly? So there yeah. I think this is essentially the unique way. You can also add another fermion. We can add more dynamical fields. But if you don't want to add dynamical fields, I think that's the only way. If you could add terms to fix it up, then you would say, OK, add the terms and don't bother me, right? You just, that's the answer. So the anomaly is always after you have used the freedom to add counter terms to fix it up. If you fail to do that, then you go to this. Yes. The uh, time is compact or non-compact, Euclidean or Lorentzian makes no difference here. Another way of saying it, the problem with Euclidean compact time is a physical problem. This is putting the system at finite temperature. So we can just view it that way. I would like to, rep to get the same answer. So I got the answer in a canonical quantization. We discussed the Hilbert space in the two states. I would like to get the same answer in a path integral formulation. The advantage of this system is that it's so simple. Just two states, free Lagrangian, everything can be calculated. And you know, I might get the signs wrong, but it's straight, completely straightforward, and we don't need fancy math. So let's compute the partition function. So we can actually do the calculation with a functional integral. Just do the functional integral over the fermions, compute the determinant. But what is the partition function? We have two states. They have, for m equals 0, they have the same energy, energy 0. They're two degenerate states. We had this term e to the i k a in the Lagrangian. So the partition function is e to the i, a line integral over, so I have a minus sign k a plus e to the minus i. So let, let me write it nicer. So there are two states. They both contribute to the partition function. One of them has charge k, and the other has charge k plus 1. And they just this factor comes from the term in the Lagrangian where I had ka. I believe it's here. Yeah, it comes from this term. And there might be an a-independent prefactor that depends on ground state energy and so forth, but I'm not going to pay attention to that. So that's the partition function. Now I can write it as some absolute value, e to the minus i k a. That's the term that existed in the Lagrangian, so that's not too exciting. Let's pull it out. I can also put some z absolute value. But that's not the full answer. Right? This is the, the term that existed in the Lagrangian, which we just copied. This is some absolute value. And the rest should be a phase. Is it clear that the rest should be a phase? We have a complex number. We wrote it as a phase times its absolute value. So the rest must be a phase. So let's give it a name. <coughs> e to the minus i pi over 2 eta of a. And I'll leave it as an exercise for you to show that a of a is 1 over pi integral of a mod 2. You pull the e to the minus i k out, so you have 1 plus. This is the argument. This thing is the argument of 1 plus e to the minus i, the corner integral. e to the minus i, the corner integral. So this is some phase, and this is the answer. Notice that it's not a continuous function of the integral dA. 
specify A, they have this mod 2. <coughs> Notice that it is a gauge invariant. What does gauge invariance here mean? And the small gauge transformations, it's obviously gauge invariant because the integral of A is corner integral. But if you have a large gauge transformation that winds around the group, this thing would be shifted by 2 pi. If this thing is shifted by 2 pi, I have a pi in the denominator. This whole thing is shifted by 2, but I defined it with a mod 2, and therefore it's gauge invariant. So the phase of the path integral, this thing is gauge invariant. That's very important. It's gauge invariant. Uh, it's independent of that, actually. It's just the first homotopy group of the circle. Sorry? It's because of the first homotopy group of the circle being. That's if, yeah, this is overkill, but it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> I can get gate transformations, which are A goes to A plus D lambda, and let lambda be such that it grows by 2 pi as I wind around. So this is gauge invariant. But it's not continuous. It can jump. It jumps when the argument here is 1. Then it jumps, because it jumps from minus 1 to plus 1. So this thing jumps. When does it jump? It jumps when z vanishes. So there are values of a for which this phase exactly cancels that phase. z vanishes. So z has some phase. The argument, the absolute value is 0. So the phase the partition function is some number, and I make small changes in A. Z becomes smaller, approaches 0, and then it comes from the other side. So the absolute value comes to 0 and goes back up, but the phase should jump by a sign. And this is exactly what this object does. Now, can we add a counter term to fix it up? Yes. What 1 over k? No, it pulls so out. I, if I, uh, from, from the second term, k plus 1, I, I was just wondering whether it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Right. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. So can we ch get rid of this eta? The only thing at our disposal are allowed local counter terms. And e to the i eta is almost an allowed counter term, but it's not quite. Because e to the, if I multiply, take the square of that, e to the minus i pi over 2 eta, and I square it, that is the same as e to the minus i a, or maybe plus i. Yeah, this is with a minus. Is a so let me just find it with a plus. So the square of this exponential factor can be absorbed in a local counter term, but the exponential itself cannot be. So some people would say, ah, the system has k equals a half and will quote unquote, approximate this factor by a half. And then they would say it's not gauge invariant. So you will often hear that the partition function of this system is not gauge invariant. And therefore, we add a counter term with a half le level a half to fix it up. Instead, the proper way to think to say is that the partition function is manifestly gauge invariant. I've done it here. But it has this funny phase with eta, which is gauge invariant, but it does not change in a continuous fashion. In other words, when one of the eigenvalues of the, the, the kinetic term goes through 0, a is such that there is a 0 eigenvalue, the complex number z goes from some phase, goes to minus that number, 
through 0. The absolute value was positive 0 and then positive again, but the phase jumps by pi. So the whole issue is with the sign. The square of this, uh, of this phase can be absorbed in the term, in a local counter term, but the phase itself cannot be. Are there any questions? Yes. Ah, so now let's, what happens when I extend to the bulk? No, not in the bulk. That's just the, the pure quantum mechanics. If I add it to the bulk, I can add to it e to the i, the same thing I had somewhere before. So if we extend to the bulk, so the phase, uh, the absolute value goes out, the e to the i k a is not interesting. So we can have e to the minus i pi over 2 a of a. And I can also add here plus i over 2 a dA in the bulk. So this is just plus or minus 1, <coughs> which is the same answer we got with canonical quantization before. I just wanted to write the path integral expression. How much time do I still have? Nine minutes. Nine minutes. Wonderful. So now we're going to do this. So quantum mechanics is wonderful because we could do everything very, very explicitly. And everything is visible. Which one? Because it's not continuous as a function of a. Yeah. So we'll later see that it really is the signal of, in field theory, it's a signal of massless particles. It's a result of integrating out massless particles. So let's move to three dimensions. And in the spirit of me changing conventions, this is a time to, I'll stay in Lorentzian signature, but in quantum mechanics, it's better to keep the signature plus one. In field theory, it's better to keep the signature minus one plus 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 one plus one. So I'll put the convention today. I will not be able to finish it today. And I'm way behind schedule anyway. So one problem at the end of the day is that there are no chalks. OK, so now we're moving to three dimensions. <coughs> So now we have fermions in three dimensions, and it's a single complex fermion. The Lagrangian is I psi bar d slash, and I'm writing a background A, psi, and more accurately, A is a spin C connection. If you don't like it, just call it U1. My conventions for the mu atom mu nu is minus 1, 1, 1, three dimensions. I'm writing gamma mu gamma nu, this is the Clifford algebra, is 2 eta mu nu. And if you want a specific representation of that, you can take gamma 0 to be i sigma 2, gamma 1 is sigma 1, and gamma 2 is sigma 3. If you don't like it, you can have others. But what is interesting about this representation of the Clifford algebra is that all the gamma matrices are real. So that's a convenient representation. It's called Majorana representation. And now I also have to define what I mean by psi bar. So psi bar is defined to be psi transpose with gamma 0. And but the spinners are also real now. For real spinners? Yeah. Right. So for real spinners, that's right. So I'll call one or two to note the fact that they are real. But for complex spinners, this is a complex spinner because it has charge one. The same thing we said before. Psi bar is psi dagger. Dagger means it is a vector. So for me, dagger is just taking the components and taking the daggers of the component. So I'm going to write explicitly the transpose. And then I put here gamma zero. I'm sure you have seen that before. And 
now we come with our symmetries. Oh, and since this is a Lagrangian for A, I can also add counter terms, properly normalized counter terms for A, and I've already discussed them before. So, what am I doing? Yes, so I can allow counter terms, which would be I, K, 1 over 4 pi, that's in Euclidean signature, so it's just K in Lorentzian signature, A, D, A, and I'm suppressing the gravitational trans Simons term. These are the gravitational trans Simons term. But k has to be an integer, and this is freedom that I have to add here. Now, there's ambiguity in regularization. There are lots of ambiguities. All these ambiguities can be absorbed in a choice of k. OK, now we come with our symmetries. What's C of psi? The complex psi. Any answer? What's charge conjugation on psi? Psi dagger, good. And we also act on the classical field A. What's C of A? Minus A. And you can check that if you look at this Lagrangian, and you do that, that's invariant. And now we would like to define T. And I'm going to use my convention rather than Tali's convention. And in my convention, T of A is minus A, which means that A0 is, all, is even and AI is odd. And in Talia's convention, C, it's CT, I get an, uh, this minus sign disappears. Now I need to find T on psi. Question number one, is it going to be psi or is it going to be psi dagger? before we do any calculation. It could be more complicated, but it, will it be psi or will it be psi dagger or psi bar? Psi. Why psi? Because that's what it was in our quantum mechanics problem. This is how we preserve the charge. So we can put psi here, and there's actually a gamma zero. And you can check that this preserves the Lagrangian. So let me write it in terms of psi 1 and psi 2. Gamma 0, psi 1. And T of psi 2 is minus gamma 0, psi 2. So psi 1 and psi 2 have opposite signs under T. And since I told you how T acts, and I told you how C acts, you can compute how CT acts by, com by combining these two transformations. And you can also take an exercise and compute C square and CT square to find out that it's minus 1 to the F, as it normally is. Sorry? The real part and the imaginary part. And when you write gamma, uh, when you write psi dagger, you just mean just psi one. This minus. this is a com this is a yeah. column vector. Yeah. Psi one dagger, psi two dagger. Psi one and psi two are real, so I don't need to put the dagger. So the dagger of psi is psi one minus i psi two, but it's sti this still a, com a column vector. Let's add some mass terms, and now we should be able to check how t acts and how C acts. <laughs> so we want to preserve the U1 symmetry. And if we want to preserve the U1 symmetry, the mass term must be that. And I defined everything. And in terms of, com of psi 1 and psi 2, mm -hmm. 
it's that. Is it invariant under C? It's invariant under U1. It's invariant under U1 because we have psi and psi bar. How do we check C? So one way of checking C is to replace psi by psi dagger and move it with the gamma zeros and all that. But instead, C maps psi 1 to itself and psi 2 to minus itself. So in this presentation, it's obvious that it is C invariant. So this term is C invariant, but it does not preserve T. So if it's not T, T is not good. C is good. So what about CT? Is CT a symmetry or not, without doing any calculation? No. Good. So this mass term breaks T and CT, but preserves C. What we'll do in the next lecture unless you want me to continue, probably not. We'll write another mass term here. Two component. It's a real Majorana fermion, which is one component, just the real part. Yeah, I don't want to write the other index because then it will be too complicated. So psi one is the real component of the complex psi. So. Now, if we want to break the U1 global symmetry, there are more mass terms that we can write down. So this is the charge 0 guy, psi bar psi. And we can also put a charge 1 or charge minus 1. So there are two more real things we can write down, which are i, psi bar 1, psi 1, minus psi bar 2, psi 2. And the other one is i, psi bar 1, psi 2, which happens to be equal to i, psi bar 2, psi 1. So in terms of u1, psi had charge 1, psi bar had charge minus 1. So we can either use multiply two of them and form something which is charge neutral, or there's a charge 1, sorry, charge 2 and a charge minus 2, and I pick these two linear combinations. So if I'm allowed to, if I want to preserve the u1, this is all I can do. If I'm willing to break the u1, any linear combination of these two would do. And using the freedom in the U1, I can pick one of them and not the other. So what we'll do next time is analyze the symmetries that are left unbroken here. And we'll see that there is a surprise. And I leave it at that. <laughs> and before I finish, if you're really motivated, try to be unsurprised by analyzing the Symmetry is yourself, because it's all straightforward now. So, how much do you have to apple?